Well, thank you all for hanging around. Um, we're getting late here, but I'm excited. The, the previous presenters have done an excellent job. Um, Damien did a fabulous job walking through JavaScript and getting us kind of to where the point um, where I'll pick up and we'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, I'll walk through kind of first a little bit of the history of jQuery, how we got to where we're at, how it became so popular, and then we'll jump into some code. Um, and so there's going to be some, some real takeaways for you. So first off, um, who am I? I am Jonathan Sharp. I started developing for the web way back in 1996. Um, AOL was a popular browser at the time. Um, modems were slow. And I'm sure there's at least one person in this room that can predate me um, even before that. But basically, the web's been around for quite a while now. I run the Omaha jQuery Meetup, and that is in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, that's where I reside and have been for the past four years. Uh, I've lived in other portions of the, the country, but one of the things I like to point out about Omaha, uh, wherever I go, is that you'll notice that the member count for the Omaha Meetup is 90. So we actually do have technology there. We do have a lot of corn, but it, it really is a, a thriving uh, community and one that's been a lot of fun to be a part of. So if you're ever flying over Omaha, feel free to stop sometime and uh, hang around. Uh, additionally, I uh, co-founded a pen to, uh, which is a company dedicated to jQuery about a year ago in October. Uh, right now we have eight employees. We're in seven states. We're a fully distributed company that has a lot of fun. Uh, aspects to it, and then a lot of challenges, um, as you can imagine. So uh, that's my, my day job. Uh, after 5 p.m., Monday through Friday and weekends, I'm a cowboy. And I have to ask, are there any cowboys in the room or cowgirls? Oh, hey. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I was in Austin, Texas. You would think that there'd be a cowboy in Austin, Texas, and there wasn't. So I am, this is awesome. <laughs> This is the first time that I've had a positive yes. OK. <laughs> Ready for jQuery. So really, there, there are four questions that we're going to answer, and then we'll get into some code. Basically, where did this jQuery come from? What was the environment that produced it? Um, why is it so popular? How has it really changed our development? And I think we've started to get a taste of that tonight. And then additionally, how is it driving innovation forward? And where are we looking at going over the next couple of years? So first, the web as we know it, this is, this is one of the things. It's highly complex. It's highly technical. There's a lot of dynamic aspects to it in terms of how a solution is brought forth. And then additionally, the exponential growth. Um, if you look at the way that the web has been adopted just over the past 10 years. So we think, think back to 2000. And um, at the time, I was working for a startup, and we were doing a web-based application. And this was exciting, but like no one really thought anything about it. It was like, oh, well, that's great. You're putting an application on the web. And we didn't even really call it a web application. It was our website, and now there's this distinction that's taken place. So oftentimes you'll hear, it's just HTML, it's just CSS, it's just JavaScript. So they're, they're really, we've kind of come through this progression where you know, you'd go to introduce yourself and you say, oh, I'm a software developer. Yeah, oh, what do you do? I'm a web developer. Oh, you do JavaScript. <laughs> and so no one really took it seriously until a couple things started happening, which is in 2006, jQuery came along. And jQuery kind of made it really easy for people to stop thinking about the technicalities of coding and really more experimenting and innovating. And that forth has really started to go and change the whole industry and how we perceive JavaScript and where we're at today. So like, this is just kind of a sampling of the technologies that you work with. So one of the things that's really exciting being in the web-based field is that there is an extreme diversity in technologies that we work with. So you go from one large organization to a small startup, and you're working with a totally different stack. You're working with the same browsers, for example, but one's on Java, another one's on PHP. You have some ASP.NET in there. There's really a highly dynamic nature in terms of how you can implement a solution. So this gets us into the web is really rich with innovation. So it really drives innovation because there's all this complexity, and there's new ways that we can plug things together. So basically, there's a, a huge number of problems that need to be solved. And this takes us back to 2006. Client side wasn't terribly exciting. You used some JavaScript, but usually it was for like a menu component, for example. Um, you, know, you, you may have like the FAQ page that you were expanding the answers with. That was really amazing. But 
really it was tedious DOM programming, and at the same time, you were having to look, okay, is this Netscape that I'm programming for? Is it IE? You had to think about a lot of these things, and that in turn was a barrier to entry. Because most of the developers were still on the back end, and when they would go to the front end, they didn't want to think about, oh my goodness, it's not rendering in this browser. It, it really didn't matter. And a lot of time, we were still targeting a single browser. Okay, so this was around the time when jQuery was born. John Resig um, had this brilliant idea. And this kind of brings us to the next point of what is a web developer really? Really a craftsman. If you look at all of the different uh, projects and jobs that you've worked across, most likely they're not all the same. You go from one job to another, and again, highly dynamic technology stack, and you're skilled at integrating, because that's really what a web developer has become these days. It's an integration-driven developer. You solve problems by taking discrete components and mixing them together. Okay, and the point being, too, that good tools generally win unless a company buys them and then sticks it on the shelf, which is always sad. So that's where, again, open source is one of the joys of working in the web development field. Okay, so this brings us to, we now have jQuery. I'll get in a little bit more about the details of that, but we have jQuery. Fast forward four years to now, and why did jQuery win? What was it that changed this industry? And that is, it integrates well. It plays well with all of these other components that you're using to build your applications. And so this is like hands down, there's a whole bunch of other reasons why it did succeed, but hands down it's an integration uh, centric tool that plays well with others. So jQuery additionally grew because it did something in its approach to integrating, and that was it leveraged existing skill sets of developers. So you know how much of a hurdle it is when you go and you pick up a new language or a new tool, and sometimes it's really easy to just say, oh, I read a book over the weekend, I know the syntax, I can jump into it. But oftentimes, you look for those familiar concepts that you can bring forward. jQuery leveraged this. So we saw CSS selectors. Well, as front-end web developers back in 2006, we weren't thinking about the DOM in the terms of a programmatic sense, but we were thinking about it from a style and design sense. So we were very comfortable and very familiar writing CSS selectors and, and expressions and that type of thing. And jQuery said, oh, you know, that's a really great pattern. Maybe I'm going to use that for then programmatically accessing the DOM, which, like I said before, was this big, tedious beast, and no one even dove into it because it was such a barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. So this improved then developer efficiency, and it lowered the barrier to entry. So people and developers that typically before would never look at JavaScript with any type of seriousness because I had to go learn this whole DOM thing and like how to access elements and all this, jQuery said, hey, you know CSS selectors. Go ahead and make use of that. And now let's just add a little bit of syntactic sugar, a really nice API that's flexible, and I can be a back-end developer that starts dabbling with this front end a little bit, and it's kind of exciting and it's not quite as hard as I thought, and all of these cross-browser issues that I was having to deal with in terms of event binding and, and DOM manipulation, all that, jQuery kind of smoothed that all over. And so what happened then was people started getting very creative. They started, ha they started to stop having to think about the DOM itself, and in turn started really thinking about ways that I can express new and creative solutions to um, those problems that I'm typically doing with server-side stack HTML. Additionally, we had Ajax really kind of come in as a, as a pattern that we could use, and it started opening up a lot more of the web as a development platform, and one where we could do a lot uh, tighter integration closer to the client. Okay. That's all to say, additionally, jQuery being an open source product really fostered a community. So I, the way that I got involved with jQuery, it was 2006. I was working for Union Pacific Railroad and working on a particular project um, for tracking vehicle logistics. And I was tasked with redoing the front end in the UI. So at the time, we were looking for tools and libraries to kind of help us. And I came across jQuery by the recommendation of a colleague. And this was March. And so jQuery had been out for three months. And there was maybe 100 developers on the mailing list, if that. But one of the things is that there's a community 
that you could get involved with and one that was really beneficial and helped you to learn. So jQuery really excelled. If jQuery didn't have a strong community, it would not be where it is today. And it would not continue to go on to where it's going in terms of innovation if that community isn't served. So again, the joys of open source. Finally, John Resig, who created jQuery, really has done a phenomenal job at protecting the core of jQuery. So if, and, and there's a couple ways that he did this. So back in the early days of jQuery, started gaining popularity, and with that becomes feature requests. So everyone has their particular situation and their itch that they need scratched, and this new cool feature is just like three lines of code, but it will solve my problem. Well, John protected the core of jQuery, and he was like, no, 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 no. And Yehuda can back me up on this, no, no, no. And then, jQuery, and then John said, you know what? You can write a plugin. A plugin's a very low cost way to extend jQuery, and go ahead and add your feature and your functionality there, and if it gains enough traction, then I'll pull it into core, but only after it gains extensive traction. So the prime example of that happening is the Dimensions plugin, which started off as a way to uh, correctly calculate the dimensions of an element cross-browser, and it used to be this plugin that you had to pull in all the time. And the fact that everyone was pulling it in, like literally everyone's pulling, you download jQuery, you download the Dimensions plugin, then it came to the point where it's like, okay, for the benefit of the community, let's pull Dimensions in. But beyond that, John has really protected the core vision of jQuery. And that's not to say that there hasn't been new innovation, but you'll see how that kind of has come out in sub-aspects of the larger jQuery project. Okay, so what is jQuery itself? It's really a DOM-centric library, and it has an API, and we've kind of started to see this already tonight in some of the, the code demos. Um, but really, the, the key points to pull out here is the plugin architecture, and again, one of the key successes. Because when someone would come with a feature request, John didn't have to say no. He would say, no, it's not going in core, but write a plugin. And so, again, fostering the community, there's the ability for you to write code specific to your situation, to share it with others, and again, the success of jQuery. So then the primary focus, jQuery makes working with the DOM really easy. The DOM in itself is a totally different programming, programming paradigm when you come from, say, maybe a traditional uh, Java backend uh, for websites. Now, if you come from a desktop environment where you're developing desktop apps, you may have some experience with kind of an evented model, an evented pattern, but typically from a web developer, especially if you come from like a designing background, not from a programmatic one, you're gonna get into this front end stuff and you're like, whoa, events. And it's just, it, it's a different way to wrap your head around things. So jQuery made working with this DOM, this living document, really easy and that pushed forward to what we typically think of as a web application today. Something that's highly dynamic, there's usually not a page refresh, and it's one where, where information is very much on demand. So the response time, uh, the, the tolerance for users is much lower. I, if I click a search, I don't want the whole search results, I want to autocomplete. Where, you know, four years ago that was a full page refresh. And again, the, the key component, again, is the AJAX. jQuery took that particular aspect of it and wrapped a really nice API around it and made it really easy to do. So what is jQuery not? And this dovetails uh, excellently on the previous presentation. It's not a shortcut to learning JavaScript. You definitely can get in and start doing things with jQuery in a very low cost way, but you don't want to say, well, I don't need to learn JavaScript then. Because it, it goes to my second point, and a bulletproof vest will not keep you from shooting yourself in the foot, okay? So think about that. I know it's late. jQuery will not prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot. And, and that's kind of one of the things that you're, it, it becomes really easy, but you've seen some, kind of some of the syntactic sugar that goes along with JavaScript, and it's very possible with closures and whatnot to kind of get out there and stuff appears to be working and it's not. So, in your quest to start getting into jQuery, make sure that you're also getting into JavaScript itself. Okay. And additionally, it's not an excuse to avoid learning web development best practices. You still have to say, I'm going to look at the craft and the skills required and make sure that I'm learning as much as possible. Now, one of the first things is that can be a hindrance in itself because of the 
the huge technology stack. Well, you need to think of it in two years from now in saying, where do I want to be with my skill set, with my career? And if you're not already a front-end developer and that's something you want to get into, start learning now, and jQuery is a great way to get into that. Okay, so I talked about this innovation. There's jQuery Core itself, which you can go to jQuery.com, pull that down. There's jQuery UI. So there's this core aspect of jQuery. Then they said, hey, we need some UI components. This originally started as a suite of plugins called Interface, which then was officially taken over by the jQuery project and turned into jQuery UI. UI has a totally separate sub-team on the jQuery project from um, the jQuery core team, and they deliver a completely different uh, set of release, they have a completely different release cycle. Um, they generally release at the same time the jQuery core does, but they have a more active release cycle. Um, and a totally different uh, core mission, and that's to provide UI components that are fully supported, fully themable, it's really awesome. Check it out, jQueryUI.com. So that wasn't exciting enough. So then this whole mobile thing is getting you know, really kind of exciting. It's heating up. I guess we should get into the game. So John Resig did this extensive amount of research, Yehuda called that out in his presentation, of the browsers that are out there. And so then the jQuery project got behind jQuery Mobile, which is in alpha release right now. Um, we'll probably land in January. And that is uh, another really innovative solution to getting into the mobile space with a very low cost entry. So literally, jQuery Mobile, one of the strengths of it is it really follows a nice um, syntactic convention pattern. So you technically don't have to write any JavaScript to do a jQuery Mobile app, which is really cool. We'll, we'll get into that hopefully if we get enough time at the end, so I'll keep going through these slides. Additionally, QUnit. So how many of you are unit testers? Okay, it's not too bad. Sometimes I get like one person. And they're usually really excited about it. Woohoo! <laughs> okay, so QUnit is really awesome. Um, it's something that we at Append2 are using for our clients a lot of the times. And it's this unit testing framework that, again, John came up with um, and some other people in the jQuery project. And it's another really nice little nugget of, of innovation in terms of being able to write tests surrounding your code. So jQuery itself is fully covered with test coverages. Um, Yehuda, how many tests are there for jQuery core? thousand, something like that. So that's really exciting. Um, I know you all love writing tests. So QUnit, short, sweet, makes it really easy. Um, I'll get into a quick demo of that. Okay, so you write your unit test. You need a way to push it out to the browser then. So John, who's employed by Mozilla, was working on this project called TestWorm. So TestWorm is really cool because you write your QUnit test. You then, on a post commit hook, for example, push them over to TestSwarm, which schedules them to browsers that are out in the wild waiting to poll. Uh, they're polling, waiting for tests to come into the queue, and then it will push it out, execute the test, push the results back to TestSwarm, which then aggregates them in real time. OK. So again, a nice little nugget of functionality that came out of the jQuery project, something that you can really work and integrate into a continuous integration type environment. jQuery itself uses this. It's fully covered with tests. And that's why it's one of the most stable pieces of software um, out there. Okay. Finally, Sizzle, which is the selector engine. So jQuery uh, initially started with a selector engine baked into core itself, but that was a piece of functionality that really made a lot of sense to abstract out and provide for use for other libraries. So you'll see this floating around Sizzle.js. What is it? It's the selector engine that is pulled in into jQuery core itself. And again, is you, if you're writing your own totally separate library, you can pull Sizzle in itself and benefit from that. Okay. So here's jQuery Mobile. Here's kind of a, a, a breakdown of the UI. Um, I'll pull up some code in a minute. But if you have a mobile device, feel free to go to jQuerymobile.com. And if you click on the demos link at the top, it'll pull you into this. The documentation for how to write a jQuery Mobile app is right here. Um, it, it's in jQuery Mobile itself. And feel free to go through and start pulling that. The source for this is out on GitHub, so you can clone it and pull the latest, but it's in hot development right now. jQueryUI.com. Um, the thing that's to point out that's really slick is the theme roller aspect of it. So it's a full UI that you can go in and tweak all of the aspects of the theme itself, from colors to rounded corners to not rounded corners, et cetera, and download a custom zip um, for that, which you can then pull in. 
And QUnit, here's a sample output of QUnit. Um, unit testing is always very exciting, so I had a screenshot of it. But you'll notice that we have one failed test down at the bottom, and it's something that's really great to get into a practice of as you write your code itself. So getting into the jQuery community itself, um, there's a couple exciting things in the work. One is that there's a uh, initiative going on right today and yesterday for um, beefing up the community tutorial. So there's something coming down the pipeline there, definitely something to watch out for. Um, you can follow jQuery on Twitter or uh, jQuery.com as it will be widely publicized. That should be out shortly. Um, the plugins are a great way to get involved. GitHub is a great source of plugins um, and one of the most active places to find them. There's api.jQuery.com. You get your full overload of the jQuery API and all of its goodness. Um, and then finally, the community forums. This is really uh, just because of the scale and scope that the community has grown to, we really had to push back to going to a forum type um, uh, solution. We were on a Google Groups mailing list, and once you get like 20,000 people, it doesn't scale. And so this is a great way to get involved. Very low cost uh, to entry, you just create an account, hop on there, and there's a ton of people um, that were able to help you get into jQuery as well as a huge wealth of information for problems previously solved. Meetups, Omaha Meetup is a great one. Um, you're more than welcome to move to Omaha and join the meetup, or if you're just coming through, um, you can also join it that way, but uh, we meet first Wednesday of the, first Wednesday of the month. Um, conferences, so jQuery Boston is kind of the big conference of the year. That was this past October, um, four weeks ago. In Boston, there will be one in the spring, usually in the West Coast somewhere. Last year, we had it at Microsoft uh, down south a little bit, so be sure to watch for that coming down the pipeline. Um, a great way to come and meet the jQuery team and get a couple days of more jQuery than you ever wanted. Okay. So I am going to uh, call out a couple things. This, this again, dovetails the, the previous presentation. So if you're looking to get into development, here are some core concepts that you really want to get under your belt. So some topics to start looking into. First is the DOM and like what that is. So the DOM is the programmatic representation of the HTML that you delivered to the browser or modified with jQuery. And so it's really what you're going to be working with. You're going to be working with this document in the browser with jQuery to modify it. So there's a couple other things that come into play when you're dealing with this DOM, such as events and event propagation. So this is, this is probably the first stumbling block or one of the early ones that you get into when you start dealing with jQuery is this whole events and how they work in the browser. So um, we'll, we'll talk about this when we get into the code a little bit. CSS and selectors, a great way. Dive into that. You benefit twofold. One is in the design aspect of your page itself as well as writing jQuery selectors. HTML5 is hot. Um, HTML5rocks.com. Uh, HTTP, this is one of the things where you really, this distinguishes a beginner to intermediate developer is understanding HTTP and what a get and a post is. So I won't cover it in this presentation, but look it up. Also, cross-domain and security. So what situations can you make an AJAX request to another domain and how that works and plays out in the browser? It's mentioned. JSON, um, we saw some JSON goodness earlier, as well as scope and closure, which you are now, all now experts at. Okay, going forward, um, what's on the roadmap? One of the questions that's really hot right now is, does jQuery support HTML5? Yes, it does. It has for a while, and it will continue to support it. It's, there, there's not a whole lot of um, anything that's big and scary with HTML5. So really get into it. Don't be afraid of like, well, that's something else I have to learn. If you know HTML, moving to HTML5 is very painless, and it's something that you can actually use today. I know the spec won't be done until like 2022 or whenever, but you can use it today. Like, it works in the browsers. So get on board. Okay, support for new browsers like IE9 with coming out. Um, again, I talked about the test coverage that jQuery has with 1,000 some tests. That makes it really easy to then run jQuery through IE9 and start addressing issues there. And so that's something that's very, uh, it, there's a high level of response from the jQuery team in addressing those. Um, mobile browser, jQuery mobile is something that, uh, again, is an alpha right now, will be out in January, and is something that you can look forward to uh, in the months and the weeks and the years to come. 
And additionally, uh, growth of really corporate support services. So this is one of the things that's exciting, um, especially since I work for Append2 and we offer corporate support services, is that there is an ecosystem now where the jQuery community itself is so large that there's really a need for this in the traditional sense of business. So I, I work for a large enterprise and Yes, we didn't pay anything for jQuery, but we still need a support contract to be able to pull it into the enterprise. So now there's those resources that are available, which makes it even greater uh, adoption within the corporate enterprise. Um, so enough said with that. Okay, so now we get into some code. This is uh, really kind of a fun demo because we start to dig into some of the concepts of jQuery itself. Uh, we start using some of the events um, some of the patterns, and we can really, this is a great point to start raising your hand and asking questions. Um, shout them out a little bit, because I can't hear the best sometimes if they're in the back. Uh, but we'll, we'll go through and really start digging in here. So this is an example of how you can do an edit in place type behavior. So this is something that traditionally you would have to do a lot of DOM scripting to get this to work in a browser, yet alone multiple browsers. And jQuery makes this really easy. And so we'll dig in here, we get the right code up in place. Okay, so um, shame on me, I'm not using HTML5, so I, yeah, forgive me. Um, but here's your traditional HTML document, and we have an unordered list with a series of list items in it. So first thing you gotta do, jQuery 101, hello world, include jQuery. So here's my jQuery.js, and then I have an additional script block here, and this is where we're gonna get into the edit in place. Now you're gonna notice that I'm, I'm gonna do some interesting things with indentation in the way that I format my code that at first may be a little bit difficult and unfamiliar if you start getting into this, but when you start writing more and more code, it makes it really easy to identify patterns quickly and discover what's going on. So first thing, um, I'm going to kick off my jQuery selector here, dollar unordered list list item. So this is gonna select all of the unordered list, all of the list items that are descendants of the unordered list on the page, and I'm gonna bind a double click event to that. So I personally tend to use bind um, instead of the shorthand methods. You could additionally rewrite this right here as the double click. Um, I just like the explicit nature of bind syntax. And once we have that double click, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump in. There's a couple things we gotta do to get this edit in place to work. First is we gotta grab the text value of that HTML node itself. And we talked about context a little bit in this. So in my callback for my bound event here to the double click, this is going to reference the list item that was double clicked. So I can then take, take this and you can see on this line here, I'm wrapping this in a jQuery object itself. So we talked about the way that you can pass in different selectors and such in the way that the jQuery object itself is very flexible. So you can pass in a function to it which executes on document.ready. You can pass in a string selector to it. You can pass in a DOM node itself and initialize jQuery with that. So this is the native browser's DOM element. It's not a jQuery wrapped object, it's just that native DOM element. I'm gonna take that, wrap it in jQuery so I get all the jQuery methods in, uh, that I can use to operate on it. And I'm gonna call dot text. So that will grab out and give me the text value of that node um, without any of the HTML tags, yada, yada, yada. Now that I have that, I'm going to do this dot empty and that will go ahead and wipe out the inner HTML of that text node, okay? Are you following the progression here? So we've grabbed the text value, we've emptied the field. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a nice little trick that jQuery provides, and I'm gonna pass in an HTML fragment to jQuery itself, and it's gonna magically instantiate it for me, and then allow me to go and set some properties on it, and then stick it back into the DOM. So I'm gonna create a new input field, I'm going to do dot val, which is going to set the text value that I just extracted as the value of that input field. Then I'm going to bind a key down event, and that's gonna be associated with that input field, which then I'm going to listen for key code 13, which is the 
return character, very good. And when that happens, I'm going to tell it to exit the field, and on we go. So, oh, and then I'm binding a blur event, which then takes the value upon exiting the field and sticks it back into the DOM, removing the input. Okay, that's all to say the final line here, which is where Append2 got its inspiration for a company name. And I must say, it's a great name, especially when you try and explain it to your parents who are not programmers. A, a pen to, or you're on the phone and you try and say, yeah, I work for a pen to. Can you spell that? Yep. Okay, just a little bit of wisdom there. Okay, so then we take that input field and we stick it back into the DOM. So this again is a very, very relatively short amount of code and I've got a lot of really highly dynamic things going on here. So then if we see this in practice, once again, for, okay, here we go, here's my input field. And you'll notice that it's now updated in the DOM itself. If I go in and inspect this in Firebug, hopefully, I forget how to, uh, here we go, okay. And you can see I've actually modified the DOM itself. So this is, if, if you don't know what the DOM is, you can see this is where we're starting to work with it. It's, it's a programmatic representation of the HTML and I'm manipulating it with JavaScript. jQuery is really good at that. Okay. So now we have the same pattern as we did before. So I can do hello world, I can spell. And I'm gonna go and add a new feature that when I click add new list item, I'm gonna go and create that element and make it editable. So let's take a look at that. And I'm gonna introduce a different concept here. Okay, so we talked about events, executing selectors. One of the things that you will notice is in the previous example, I am going to execute this selector, UL, LI, at the top. That is gonna select all the elements that exist in the DOM at that point in time when that selector was, was executed. That works great until you start dynamically inserting elements. So there's a couple ways that you could do that. When you insert a new element, you could then go through and bind all those same events and that type of thing. That's not very exciting. A better way to do it is what, again, we saw in our previous use of dot .live or another method called dot .delegate which does a similar thing, but we're gonna make use of a pattern in the DOM, which is event propagation, and we're gonna leverage that. So what I'm gonna do here is, here's my unordered list, and I'm gonna call dot delegate li double click. So what this is going to do, this is going to attach an event handler to my unordered list. It's going to then, uh, in, in attaching the event handler is gonna attach the double click event. That event handler then is going to listen specifically for double click events that originated on a list item here, okay? This is where the benefit is huge because I'm gonna attach one click handler to the unordered list, however many list items I insert, add, remove, whatever, when a user double clicks on that, the event's gonna first trigger any double click handlers on that list item itself. Then that event gets handed up to its parent, which in this case would be an unordered list, which has the event handler and it's gonna trigger it. This is excellent and very exciting. I, I will tell you, before event delegation, events were a little more hairy. So, excellent question. Okay, so why, is, why does dot .delegate differ from a dot .live? The only difference in live is that it forces you to make a selection of those elements at the point when you execute. So this is going to go out and look for all list items within an unordered list right then versus with dot delegate where it is going to defer looking for any li elements until an event originates on them and that event bubbles up. So it's a huge performance benefit at the time of binding and setting up events. Okay, we have the same style of code in the body of this, such as var text to pull out the text, we're gonna empty it, and we're gonna append it. 
One of the things that you'll notice here is that we're going to start using a concept in jQuery called chaining. So write that down. We'll look it up. But basically, you have the ability to select an element and perform a series of operations on it by doing dot next method. So I have dollar this dot empty dot append. So it's going to take my list item, it's going to empty it, and it's going to append a new input this text. New input is a function that I introduced up here at the top. And it's going to take a target element on which it's going to append the input itself to, as well as the text to stick in the value. So this is just a helper utility method that I made. And it's going to make it really easy then when we do our add uh, new item at the end. OK. So now, here's our anchor tag with an ID of new item for adding a new list item. So what we're going to do here is we're going to attach a click event. And I'm going to use the shortcut dot click. I'm going to create a new list item ad hoc, passing in a HTML element to jQuery. So I now have an instantiated list item object. And I'm going to append to that list item my new input. And I'm going to set up the default value to be your new list item. And that all gets appended to my unordered list with the ID of my list. And you can see that right here. And so now if I do new list item. So one of the things that you'll notice that'd be really cool here is that if I went and actually focused that input field then um, after it's appended. So what I can do, if I can find my mouse, yep, I can do a dot find. So I'm going to use chaining. And dot find is going to start from the current element. And it's going to look at any of the siblings. So I'm going to look for. Um, an input, and I'm going to call trigger focus. And that is going to actually focus the input of that field. If it works, which it didn't. <laughs> Pending this find, find input. Did I? No, that didn't work. OK, I think it's a timing issue. So what I'm going to do, do this another way, because there are multiple ways to <coughs> fix things. I can do set timeout. Uh, wait, I have 50 milliseconds for the DOM to stabilize. And then I'm going to do uh, in, input. Ha! OK, there you go. I tell you, thank you, thank you. There, there's no thrill like writing code in front of 200 people. <laughs> it's like that extreme programming times 200. Um, OK, OK, so I had a question about some effects. Here's an example of, ah, there we go, of hiding elements. So jQuery gives you the ability to do animation. Here's an example of where we want this snazzy thing because your boss came and said we have this new requirement and we need animation because we hear it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And you say, no problem, and you go write the jQuery and it saves your, your job. So here we're going to, in this example here, we have the classic list. We're going to go ahead and use our .delegate method again, which you are all experts on now. And we're going to use this fade out. So if you go to api.jQuery.com and you type in fade out, it'll give you all of the syntactic glory of this method. And basically, the way it breaks down is you pass in a time. So this is in milliseconds. So 2,000 milliseconds is two seconds. And a callback function to execute at the point where the animation is complete. So in this case, I'm going to do something terribly useful, such as alert finished fading. And I'm going to change this to 1,000 just to make it even more exciting. And if I refresh my page, you can see that now it takes a second, and there's my alert at the end. OK, that's a nice animation example. So here's a more typical use case, though. So you have a table of data. You Rather than double clicking on the row itself, I'm going to click on the X, and you can see that it fades out the row in wonderful glory. You can reset. And what I'm actually doing here, and you can see in the code that I have uh, below it, is I'm going to do a fade out which is going to just hide that DOM element. I'm not actually removing it from the DOM, which makes it really easy then to reset 
I'm going to execute a jQuery selector, tr colon hidden. So that's going to go and find all of my table rows that are hidden in the DOM, and I'm going to call dot fade in normal. And normal is just a string value for a default animation time. So where this really becomes useful is when we are pulling up my code. OK. So we're going to do something. We're first going to, uh, when the user chooses to remove a field, we're going to actually animate it being removed, so give some user some feedback. And then we're going to programmatically go back to the server to update state um, so that that row is then removed when the user continues using that application. So how you could typically do that would be using what we've seen so far, fade out slow. And then down here at the bottom, I have a to-do. Make an AJAX request to a server to remove the row from the database. So you could pull the ID of that row, for example, kick off an AJAX request, basically without a page refresh, and send that back to the server and say, update your state. There's a couple things that you could do then at that point. You could wait for the response to come back from the server, giving you confirmation that that transaction was successful and you don't need to roll back. Or if the transaction failed, you could then fade the row back in and present a pretty message such as, oops, I'm sorry, please try again. OK. Um, here is our next example, which we're combining a couple of concepts that we've talked about so far. We have the edit in place, as well as the fade out and remove. So I'm using the same behavior. There it goes. Um, to do a couple things. Here's my input, which I'm going to bind it, my double click to the table. This is using, um, rather than dot delegate, this is using dot bind and performing a lot of the work behind the scenes to make sure that the element that was clicked is the one. So dot delegate is a very nice way to do this without having to do the tedious work of determining what element was particularly clicked. I leave this example in here, though, so that you can see that bind itself is very useful if you really need to get low level to the nuts and bolts of events as they originate and such. OK. Um, we'll go back to <clears throat> this exciting example. So here I have a list of 50 states. And we're doing a couple things. I'll fire up Firebug here. Now we're getting into, whoa, <laughs> it's late. OK, so we're kicking off AJAX request. So um, we're going to go, and on page load, we're going to go to the server and request a chunk of data. And then we're going to dynamically render the UI with the data that came back. So if I expand my get here, you can see the response that came back. Here's this wonderful JSON object notation with my list of states. I'm going to iterate over. Um, I have to confess, I'm not using the template plugin, and you could refactor this to use the template plugin, um, but I didn't for sake of demo. OK. So what we're going to do, first I declared a function, and you could wrap this entire block into a anonymous self-executing function. I typically don't explain that concept in my presentation, and so I didn't do it here because that would just, that's a rabbit hole. So, um, but it is a best practice, so do that. But I created a function called load states here. I'm optionally accepting an argument called search that you could then pass in to filter the results. Um, search just gets passed back to the server itself. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, my PHP script that's serving up the data, I have data.delay, and I can pass in an arbitrary value here, and it will just sleep for that amount so I can simulate uh, lag of the connection um, on the server. So I'm going to call .getJSON. This is a nice utility method for the underlying base jQuery function called $.ajax. So $.ajax gives you really the full control over that entire AJAX request. .getJSON gives you the ability to um, automatically set a number of properties that are typical when requesting JSON, such as the type of data coming back, which is JSON. OK. So first argument here is the URL. The second argument is data that is passed to the server, so any key value pairs, in this case, data. And then my callback function to execute at the point when the data is returned from the server. And that callback function is passed the actual data itself. 
at this point, it's already been evaluated. It, the data comes from the server as text. It's been evaluated now into an actual JavaScript object literal, which I can start using in programmatically. And the thing to point out here is the way that you deal with JSON data, there's some security concerns around it. Because uh, it used to be when JSON first came out, it was really cheap and easy to get that data back from the server and call eval on it. And a malicious person, not that there are any in this world, but if there was a malicious person, they could pass a function that could potentially arbitrarily get executed. So jQuery in 1.4 upped the ante in terms of it does not eval the code, it does actual parsing of that JSON um, in a very efficient way, and so there aren't any security concerns with that. So um, if you have more questions, come talk to me afterwards and I can talk to you about the joys of security in JavaScript. Okay. So now that I have the data from the server, I select states, which is my table. I select the t-body, child element of that, and I'm going to empty it out. So if I have any existing data in there, I'm going to clear it, and then I'm going to use a utility method, which is $each. So you can pass an array. This is a very nice way. Um, it's an iterator pattern. So if you come from JavaScript, or excuse me, if you come from JavaScript, if you come from Java or other languages that have iterators, you pass an array of data and it executes the callback function passing the key as the first argument and the value as the second argument. So I'm going to iterate over here and construct a table row and then append to that a series of table data elements, finally appending that to the table. There are ways that you could highly optimize this, but for sake of uh, demonstration, it's a little bit more expanded. Okay, so that gives us and here is the load states where I execute that on page load. If I go back to my demo. So I talked about that search parameter. So now I have the ability to go in as I key in values. So let's go to Nebraska here. You can see that it kicked off an AJAX request down here at the bottom, returned a result set, which was filtered. So the server did all the filtering there. You could do it client side, but I left it to the server. And the response that came back, then I re-rendered the front end. So this is a way that you can start building really dynamic things very quickly with jQuery itself. Okay, in the handful of minutes I have left, I'm going to uh, pull up. So we talked about unit testing. Um, I'm gonna talk about mocking just a little bit because this is not typically something that you think of from the front end. So uh, I wrote a plugin to jQuery because plugins are really cool in jQuery called MockJax. What it does is allow you to define a series of parameters uh, that are typical for an AJAX request that would be generated by a developer. And instead of actually letting that AJAX request go off, it will intercept it and allow you to provide mock data back. So where this becomes really beneficial and where this originated from is at a pen to, we typically would start a project. Our demarcation point is the front end. We don't do a whole lot of back end. We have experience with it, but we don't typically code it. So we'll start a project and the client will say, hey, I've got this REST-based services. I'm going to give you JSON. And it's going to look like this, but it's going to take us a month to get it done. And we say, no problem. Tell us what it looks like. We'll put the MockJax plugin in there. We're able to mock that entire data using the end live URL that we're going to be calling against. And then when the client says, OK, our web service is ready, we simply remove the MockJax plugin, don't change any of our code, and it goes against production and works beautifully. So first step to using a jQuery plugin is to include it, jQuery.mockjax. What I'm gonna do here is go ahead, and this is what I have to do to mock an AJAX request. So you provide a series of parameters that mockjax will use to test as AJAX requests come through. If it matches those parameters, it'll intercept that request, responding with the mock, um, or if it doesn't match those, it'll let it go through just as a typical AJAX request. So since our URL is json-1.php, and I threw a star character on the end, so anything that begins with that, um, I'm going to have a response time of a second and a half, and the response text, um, I'm just gonna provide an object literal. So I have JSON coming back here. I'm going to set the response text, which is the actual XML HTTP request object response that comes. It will then have a list of states, just Oregon, um, because that's the only state. So, now that I've uncommented this, I haven't changed any of my production code. So up here at the top, my, whoops, somewhere around here, um, you'll notice that my json1.php, here it is, still exists. And if I go ahead and to my browser, 
I go ahead and refresh it. And you'll see down here at the bottom in Firebug, it says mock get. And that just means that the mock jacks intercepted that request and then delivered back my payload. So I can see that there wasn't an actual AJAX request that went off. Um, but this makes it really easy to develop your apps based against data services that don't exist, um, but in a production level way. Yes, it is a plugin. If you go to github.com slash append to, um, actually go to Twitter. I tweeted it right before I came up here. Um, so if you want to find me on Twitter, I am JD Sharp. And my last tweet, hopefully, yep, here it is. There's my tweet, which takes you over to GitHub, which will give you the MockJax plugin. Um, additionally, there's a link if you go to the wiki and you go to the blog post there. This goes in details, uh, the entire overview of the API and all the different flexibility um, that you can do with it. Okay, now it's time for giveaways. Thank you.